Many of you know that uh, the focus of the program over the last 15 years has been very focused on tech transition. And technology transition is always a challenge, uh, but it's really great when we can see the things that we have funded in the government, um, they, they come out as a product in the marketplace. And before we uh, start into this round, we're gonna run a video to show you a few of our successes. When you look at the philosophy of transition at s and the philosophy is how do we get this product away from just being research in actually doing something. DNSSEC is a security extension to the basic DNS protocol. s and efforts were absolutely crucial. Had it not been for them, we wouldn't have had a program. We built the world's first cybersecurity rating system. Without the s and funding, Quadmetrics wouldn't exist, and FICO's cybersecurity initiatives would be in a very different place than they are today. The Logic Consortium set a new standard for collaborations. Without the support and structure of s and logic wouldn't happen. We have spawned out of this effort the whole field of memory forensics. As a result of the effort of s and funding us, that technology is now in every copy of Windows that ships from Microsoft. Endeavor's objective was to take fast-moving virus and worms that were coming into a network, extract what was unique about them, and to implement a defense based upon that uniqueness. With the support of S&T, we were able to get into the market space commercially. It's really a great opportunity to say, I have some ideas, I'm not sure how to bring them to market and to find a partner in s and And that makes what they do very different. s and gets it by understanding technological innovation, societal impact, and how you implement it to achieve it. That's what it means when we say s and gets it. Technology, implementation, transition to practice. Our next panel uh, are four uh, successes that we count in our, uh, our portfolio. Our first speaker will be Anita D'Amico. She's the CEO of CodeDX, which is a startup which offers application security solutions spun out of uh, Secure Decisions, uh, which is an R&D organization where Anita has been for 20 years. And uh, interestingly, her roots are in experimental psychology and human factors, and she applies that into her uh, product of today. Second speaker behind Anita will be Ben Lemire. He's the CEO and co-founder of Burla Corporation. He's a widely recognized subject matter expert in digital forensics and security with more than 20 years of military and government service, and they have a, a product in the market uh, today. Third behind uh, Ben will be Dr. Greg White. He's been involved in computer and network security since 1986. He spent 30 years with the Air Force and Air Force Reserves. He currently serves as the director of the Center for Information Assurance and Security and is a professor at the University of Texas, San Antonio. He is very active in the development of cybersecurity competitions and was instrumental in the development of the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition and the Cyber Patriot National High School Cyber Defense Competition. And he'll present our work that we have uh, done with him over the last several years. And our fourth speaker today is uh, Ang Shui. He's the founder and CEO of Red Balloon Security in New York City. He's an inventor of Symbiote, which is a firmware defense technology uh, for embedded systems and FRAC, which is a firmware analysis and malware tool, or modification tool. He's received numerous awards for his work um, and uh, received his PhD from Columbia University in 2015. We'll take the four of them, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So please hold your questions until uh, the last speaker. Anita, it's up to you. Thanks very much, Doug. You've all heard about big data breaches like Equifax. But did you know that most of them start with an attacker exploiting a software vulnerability? To an attacker, a vulnerability is like an unlocked window that provides an easy way to break in. But application security finds and fixes those software vulnerabilities before an attacker can exploit them. However, developers and security analysts have been slow to adopt application security. And that's because AppSec testing is labor intensive and time consuming, and it produces a mountain of results that require days of further analysis. This inspired DHS to fund research to address these obstacles to adoption, and CodeDX is a direct result of that R&D. There are five problems that CodeDX addresses. Complexity. AppSec testing tools like static code analyzers and dynamic pen testing tools are hard to configure and run. Coverage. 
No single tool is good enough to find even half of the vulnerabilities. You have to run multiple tools and combine them all to get what's called good vulnerability coverage. And each one has to be configured, which further compounds that complexity problem. Correlation. Running all those different tools creates yet another problem. Each one produces thousands of potential security issues, all in different formats, which makes it very difficult to combine them and compare them. Prioritization. It can take days to analyze the many security issues that come out of these tools and separate out the critical vulnerabilities and the compliance problems from minor issues and false positives. Order. Managers and developers need a single place to co coordinate and track the many disjointed processes that they use for AppSec testing and vulnerability remediation. So those are the five problems that CodeDX addresses, which I refer to as the C3POs. <laughs> CodeDX solves those problems through automation. And here are its top five capabilities. Orchestration. CodeDX automatically configures and runs AppSec tools. Just load your source code in, it figures out which tools to run, and it runs them for you. Correlation and consolidation. CodeDX automatically correlates the results of many different tools. It gets rid of the duplicates and then presents you with a unified set of results that are neatly categorized by common problem areas. Prioritization. CodeDX automatically sorts your security issues by vulnerability type, severity, and regulatory compliance, like PCI, HIPAA, or DISA-STIG. Management. It provides a centralized platform that you can use to orchestrate tools, uh, consolidate the results, assign vulnerabilities for remediation, and track progress. And DevSecOps. To keep pace with the rapid release cycles, CodeDX works seamlessly with CICD pipeline tools like Jenkins for continuous security. CodeDX is now used across government and industry by credit card companies and banks. It's used by manufacturers like Honeywell and aerospace companies like Raytheon, by insurance companies and healthcare providers like the US Health and Human Services Agency. NASA uses CodeDX in its IV and V function. DOD is using CodeDX to secure its mission critical software. It's used by Army SIRDEC, Navy SPAWAR, and NAVAIR, and by Hill Air Force Base. And JFAC procured a large license of CodeDX for use by smaller DOD agencies. Of course, DHS is reaping the benefits of its investment. CodeDX is used by CISA, CWMD, and the offices of the CIO. And CodeDX is a commercial success. Sales have doubled each of the past three years, and we've been recognized by Gartner as a major player in two new AppSec markets. And CodeDX is making a difference across the spectrum of adoption. At one end are those just starting out in AppSec. They see CodeDX with its pre-configured tools and automation as their AppSec starter kit. At the other end of the spectrum, are organizations that have already invested in a diversity of tools. They use CodeDX to establish order to their point solution products and processes. So in short, what started out as the seed of an idea under a DHS SBIR program has become the leading application security system of record. You'll be able to see it today at 4 o'clock. If you come by booth 19, we'd be happy to show it to you. And thanks to DHS for helping us start this technology. Good morning. My name is Ben Lemire, and uh, I'm the CEO of Burla. And today I just want to take a few minutes and talk to you about vehicle data, how it's used by the law enforcement community, and the tools that we've created with DHS to be able to uh, help them out. Around 2012, Burla started an internal research and development project that focused on getting the GPS data from vehicles. And what we found was there was a significant amount of other types of data that would really help investigators out to answer those hard questions like what happened, where it occurred, and who was involved. 2013 is when we partnered with S&T and we started to create a solution for identifying, acquiring, and analyzing data from vehicle systems. 
Now, I'm not sure if everybody knows this or not, but vehicles hold a vast amount of data. On average, there's about uh, 50 to 75 different electronic control units or systems in cars. Collectively, those systems execute over 150 million lines of code, and they generate over 25 gigabytes of data per hour. What we're really interested in goes into about three categories. Connected devices. Uh, connected devices, the most common type are mobile phones. Whenever I connect my mobile phone to uh, Bluetooth in a vehicle or to a USB port, things like my contact list, my call logs, and my text messages, some of you are probably very nervous right now, get pulled down onto the vehicle. Uh, and they stay there for many, many years. Location data would tell us anywhere the car has been or where the car is intended to go. That's things like save locations, previous destinations, and track logs. Track logs are the breadcrumb trails that tell you everywhere a car has been. The third category is vehicle events. Vehicle events are things that a vehicle logs just in its inherent normal operations. So say a driver's door opens, passenger door closed, the headlights are turned on, uh, or even what gears the vehicle is shifted into. Another thing that's important to understand before I tell you about the tools is there's a very clear process that emerged over the last five years of doing this, and it really comes down to these three things. Uh, whenever you talk about identifying vehicles, that really speaks to investigators in the field and their need when they're on scene to be able to figure out what kind of car it is, what systems are installed, and what kind of data they can expect to get out. During the acquisition phase, it's normally forensic technicians that are trying to find or locate the modules in the car that have the data and be able to access those and remove them. And during the analyze phase or when you have the forensic examiners that need to take that deep dive in and find the key evidence within the car or those systems. So Ivy or Project Ivy really created a collection of tools and those collection of tools speak directly to the process uh, that investigators go through. So you've got the mobile app that supports investigators in the field and on scene. You've got a hardware kit for the technicians. And then you've got a forensic software for those analysts to be able to take that deep dive. The mobile application really supports investigators uh, by allowing them to do lookups in the field. Uh, it also gives them exactly what data they can expect to get out. You would really hate to seize a vehicle, drag it all the way to the impound lot, and find out that there are no track logs and that's not available in that car. So it tries to help them save as much time as possible. It also helps them uh, identify exactly what systems are in there by giving them um, guides that walk them step by step how to do that. And it also gives them those step by step instructions of how do you remove the systems from the car. They can do all that from their mobile device while they're out in the field in the middle of the night. The hardware kit, like I said, it contains all the tools an investigator or technician needs. It's got special device interface boards and cables in it. It's about the size of a carry-on piece of luggage at this point, um, and it allows them to be able to connect to the vehicle and get the data out. The forensic software is really the workhorse. It's what centralizes all aspects of this ecosystem. Uh, it's what allows the investigators to be able to take that deep dive and see things in hex and text uh, and be able to do searches it also has a robust analytical capability. It allows them to view the track logs on a map. It allows them to put the different events that have happened on a map as well. So you can see where a door opened, what gears were shifted into, when windows were rolled down, when seatbelts were fastened. All these things can be mapped out or viewed on a timeline so it helps them to be able to see exactly what happened where and figure those key pieces of evidence out. The impact has been pretty significant. Uh, our partnership with DHS has allowed us to get a capability into the hands of investigators uh, quicker than any other capability we've ever built. Uh, it's really allowed us to directly affect military and law enforcement operations worldwide to have very positive outcomes. Uh, when we first started this, Ivy only supported about 80 models of vehicles, and today it supports over 14,000 models. There's no way we could have done this without the partnership with DHS. If you think this is something that you can use uh, in your organization, feel free to download the mobile app. Uh, accounts are freely available to anyone in the Homeland Security community. It's available on the Google Play Store and in the App Store. Thank you.
Good morning. As Doug mentioned, I'm uh, Dr. Greg White from the University of Texas at San Antonio, the Center for Infrastructure Assurance and Security. And the slides are somewhere. There we go. And uh, I'm here to talk about the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. To begin with, why? What was the need for the collegiate competition or any cybersecurity competition in the first place? We designed the competition to address two primary issues that were prevalent in cybersecurity. The first is one that I'm sure that we're all probably aware of, the fact that we have a number of uh, cybersecurity open positions out there that we don't have the bodies to fill. And this is not projected to get better any time in the near future. As a matter of fact, depending on what study or what report you read, the number of projected open positions that will go unfilled are anywhere between a few hundred thousand and several million worldwide positions. We have to do something to try to attract more people to the career field, to make more people aware of cybersecurity as a, a potential field of study and a potential job uh, for them. The other issue was a common complaint that we received, which was our graduates from colleges and universities were not prepared right out of college to be able to address the kind of issues that, that industry and government needed. They had the book learning, but they didn't have the hands-on experience that was required. And so oftentimes, organizations had to send their uh, new employees out for training, additional training or certifications or whatever before they could become, well, useful uh, to the organization. Uh, and if we have a problem with the number of, of, of employees, we need more employees, we have a, a lot of employees holds positions to fill, we don't want to have to wait once we hire someone weeks or months before they're going to become useful. So that's what the collegiate, National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition was designed to do, to address those two issues. Competitions we've seen in other areas have a tendency to draw attention, to make people more aware of any, uh, whatever the sport or competition is, is about addressing, and we wanted to do that with the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Also, we wanted to provide a hands-on opportunity that many of the students were not getting in their normal academic program. They were getting, once again, the book learning, but they weren't necessarily getting the real world hands-on experience that the industry and government, the organizations in the real world needed. So we designed the competition to be as real world as possible. The other thing I wanted to stress, because there's a misconception about this, you notice it says a cyber defense competition. That doesn't mean that the individuals who participate in this competition only know about defensive cybersecurity. For heaven's sakes, you know, if you think about it, if I'm going to adequately protect my system, I want to know what my poten potential adversary is going to know about my system. So I want to run the tools that they're going to run before they run it on mine. I want to find out about those vulnerabilities before those, they find out about the vulnerabilities. And I guarantee everybody at the national championship knows about both sides or they wouldn't be at the national championship. In terms of the competition itself, just to let you know how it's designed to give you a feel for it, the students, when they get there, they, they enter their room, we let them into the rooms on day one of the competition, they have no idea what the network looks like. It's, they've just been hired by an organization. They don't know what the software is running, they don't know what hardware they've got, they're gonna to have to learn that. They're gonna to have to learn that as quickly as possible. They also don't, you know, they, uh, not only do they not know about the technology, they don't know what the company is. Uh, we change the company every year. We, we try to be, do different things. Uh, for example, we've done power companies, small municipal power companies, where their job was basically keep the lights on. That's what they had to do. We have had uh, online gaming company, companies. Uh, we've actually also had a correctional facility one year, which was a real interesting learning endeavor on our part to simulate a correctional facility. So these folks are in the room, we tell them, we guarantee that that network is operational, that is functional, we don't guarantee it's secure. As a matter of fact, you can probably bet there's some holes in it. So what the students are graded on, what they're scored on, two main things. First of all, they're given a list of services that they must maintain. These are critical services to the organization. They have to keep these things up and running. If they don't, they lose points. If they have a specific service that's down longer than a certain number of checks in a row, they have a service level agreement which really hits them. So they've got to keep those services running. The other thing that they have, that they, they face, are injects. Throughout the, the two-day competition, they're gonna be faced with a bunch of business tasks that may range anywhere from here's a list of new employees and employees that have been fired, update the access control list, to what is depicted in that middle picture there. We have a individual who, uh, who 
uh, functions as the CEO, and he asks for, in this case, he wanted a report. He wanted a specific security policy on new technology that he'd heard about and how the company was going to handle it, and the teams had to go brief him. They had to present the policy that they wrote and brief him on that specific policy, and he got to, to quiz them on that, and they're scored on those business injects, whether they uh, do them and how well they do them. Meanwhile, as soon as they're let into the room, we have a red team. We have a group of security professionals from uh, government and uh, academia and industry that start banging away on those systems. They also don't know, they don't have any advanced knowledge of what the network is all about, the hardware, software, whatever. So they have to use a lot of the same techniques that a normal attacker would to discover what the systems are all about. And finally, we have a networking event because we have sponsors that come and have told us that this is the single best networking event that they go to in terms of recruiting because every student there is someone that they would be interested in hiring. They have the skills that they want. So impact, once again, we're addressing that issue of, of, of needing more professionals. We've gone from original, the original five team uh, competition, thanks to DHS and the support from DHS, we now have 231 colleges and universities across the country participating. You can see the number of students that, that are, that are uh, participating as well, thousands of students that are participating in this competition at either the state, regional, or national level. The 100% uh, placement for students that go to the national, they all got jobs because they have the knowledge, skills, and abilities that the recruiters are looking for. As a matter of fact, folks say, like I said, they, it's the single best recruiting event, and our recruiters actually are starting to look at resumes and looking for um, CCDC on resumes, because that tells them something. Now, one other impact that this has had, so that takes care of the hands-on. What about the awareness? CCDC has basically led to Cyber Patriot. We are one of the co-founders of the Cyber Patriot uh, uh, high school competition, which has now gone into a middle school as well, which is now also summer camps, K through six initiative, and it's being used in colleges, college labs for uh, at the collegiate level. That has now morphed into four different international competitions. And so it's just growing because remember, it's a worldwide problem, a worldwide shortage. And we don't want to have all of the US students going off it's a competitive environment. We don't want them all to leave the United States to go to other countries. We would need them here. Okay, it also has led to uh, some additional con uh, collegiate level competitions, which have also bled into industry. And this last fall, thanks to, uh, to some funding from DHS, we went international with a collegiate level competition. We've also seen uh, not only the, the high school and the middle school programs and the K through six initiative, we also have initiatives now for those folks who are not digital natives, if you will. So the impact of that, and thanks to the support from DHS, we've been able to address those two things. We're not there yet in terms of filling those empty open positions. We've got a lot more to fill still, but we're making some headway on that and we're providing the hands-on knowledge that the folks need. Thank you. All right, let's see if uh, Ang knows how to use the clicker. Yes, I do. Wait, can I go back? Yes, all right. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ang Sui. I'm the founder of Red Balloon Security. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many of you folks uh, have already heard about Red Balloon and know what Symbio does? You know, that's about half. So if you just turn next to each other and tell the other person, then we'll be done. But uh, yeah, in about six minutes, we're gonna hit 100% uh, on that. Red Balloon Security is a company that focuses exclusively on creating technology that secures all of the embedded devices that matter the most uh, to this country and for this world. So what is an co embedded computer? It's pretty much everything that's not a laptop, server, or a desktop uh, that runs the world. So let's look around in this room. Uh, I'm sure we have microphones and cameras on the ceilings and on the walls that are connected to small embedded computers that is while listening to and watching everything that we do. Let's think about our personal and professional existence and everything from the dozens of computers in our cars to the microphones and small embedded computers inside our office to the things that are inside our homes that watch every part of what we do inside that space to all of the uh, infrastructure pieces that we don't typically think about too much but are very important like the utilities infrastructure, our power infrastructure, telecommunications, and of course you know, defense and legacy weapon systems. So those are all of the embedded devices that we care about the most and we, we spend our time thinking about ways to protect. Now let's just 
look at you know what ha what can go wrong with the exploitation of something you know silly like, uh, on on the commercial side for embedded devices. Okay, Mirai was a botnet that uh, caused the world's largest denial of service attack by a factor of two. Right? And it wasn't done using desktops or laptops. It was done using home routers and IoT doodads that we had around the house and security IP cameras. Uh, and um, you know, we didn't think that those things were very important to secure, but look at the impact that that has caused just on the commercial side. Now, let's think about what would happen if that kind of exploitation was possible and existed and is happening on the critical infrastructure side. So unfortunately, there are way too many examples to talk about. I'm just gonna pick one. Uh, there was um, a Cisco router implant that the community found more or less by accident. Uh, and for folks who don't know what a Cisco router is, you know, they are pretty important in making the internet and a bunch of other networks work on the planet. Uh, and this malicious implant uh, was put in there and probably operated for years before somebody came along and found it by accident. So what happens if that type of malicious implant existed not just in the very important routers that ran the internet, but also in embedded controllers that ran our power infrastructure or communication infrastructure and, you know, of course, defense and legacy weapon systems. Uh, and that is something that Red Balloon does. Uh, well, we create technology that prevents that from happening. So I'm a pragmatist. I don't believe that there ever will be a day where the whole world shuts down every in, uh, insecure, vulnerable embedded device and say, okay, let's stop the market, let's stop everything, let's replace every embedded device with a more secure piece of hardware with more secure piece of firmware, right? That will never happen. And I think we need to be uh, realistic and admit to ourselves that we will always be in a situation where we have to deal with the vulnerabilities that exist in the legacy embedded devices that exist today in our infrastructure. So you need to create a technology that can, you, can be used to automatically inject into the firmware of every one of these embedded devices uh, that protect them from exploitation today. Okay? And this, in short, we need something like a universally compatible endpoint or embedded defense for every single thing that is a computer on this planet. And that is exactly what Symbio technology is. Uh, Symbio was invented at Columbia University and has been worked on at Red Balloon Security. We've been doing this for the last uh, decade. And how it works is it is a entirely universally compatible OS agnostic endpoint security technology that we inject into the firmware update of every embedded device that we want to protect. We can do this without uh, having access to or changing a single line of code. And what's more important is that we can do this without requiring any hardware change or any additional hardware, which means every embedded device that matter that is in production or is in design today, uh, and every single embedded device that already exists today can autom automatically be uh, protected by Symbio technology without pretty much anyone doing any extra work. Now, uh, now coming up with the idea is really only half uh, the challenge. Uh, and the uh, transition is hard, and this is why we love working with DHS ST. Uh, here, here's some numbers that talk about our transition effort. It took four and a half years between the first academic publication of the idea of Symbiote to a commercial device protected by the Symbiote selling on some shelf somewhere. Uh, it took us uh, 13 months to go from zero embedded devices protected with Symbiote technology to over one million devices in the world. And this is the number that I and we are all very proud of. Symbiote has been operating for over 40 continuous hours uh, in the world protecting commercial embedded devices without a single documented failure. So not only were we able to, to take this idea, turn it into a reality and a commercial product and get it out there in the world, we have never failed once uh, in the 40 billion hours that Symbiote has been uh, operating in, in the real world. Now, Symbiote isn't just a clever little trick that we license to device manufacturers to make it slightly more secure. Uh, it's much more than that. It is a way forward. It is a way forward for embedded device manufacturers in the various verticals that depend on the security integrity of their devices, but they don't want to reinvent the wheel in terms of making cybersecurity for their devices over and over again. So, for example, this is what we've been able to do uh, in terms of impact in the printing vertical alone. You know, think about printers five years ago. Right? There was really no talk of secure printing. And this is one of the loudest messages from the, what, the world's largest printer manufacturer today. And that message is that HP makes the, most, the world's most secure printer. And that claim is based on the fact that Symbiote was introduced into those uh, printers and has been for the last four years. And you know, this is the tip of the iceberg. The things that we care about the most are the other embedded devices that our modern existence depends on. 
Think about all of the computers inside the industrial control system, our utility infrastructure, every single car in the world, our defense weapon and defense systems. These are the embedded devices that matter the most, and these are the embedded devices that Symbio has focused on securing for the last decade. Uh, and if you want to see some of these things work, uh, we have a bunch of really cool demos uh, at the booth, and also Dr. Bach sitting over there will also have a more technical discussion on Wednesday about some of the newer technologies that we're building around Symbiote. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. Yeah. Great, thanks. Now it's your turn. You get a chance to ask some questions. Anybody have any questions for the four you just heard from? Right here in front, please, with a microphone. Right here, Peter. Give him, give him, give him a few seconds. Peter runs fast. He's good. <laughs> there we go. My question is for Mr. Lemur. Uh, sorry, I pronounced that wrong. Uh, if I pull the battery out of uh, my car, turn the key, will half of that data go away? Nope. It's all embedded in the firmware. It's all embedded? Not in the firmware, but it's, in, it's embedded in the memory. OK. On a scale of 1 to 10, how hackable is that vehicle? Uh, it's fairly difficult. I mean, it's not something that a traditional um, hacker is going to be able to get to. It's more of a state-sponsored piece. All right. Thank you very much. Great. Next, questions? In the middle here, Teresa. Hi, thanks. Um, question again for Ben Lemaire. Uh, what, uh, can you refresh us on what are the limitations on how long you can hold on to any personal data that might be collected, and what steps or how easy do you make it to limit the personal data locations, those contacts, et cetera, that might be sw uh, swept up by these connections? Sure. Um, it, it, it all depends. Standard forensic answer applies. Uh, it really depends on the systems, the amount of memory they have, and how much they're used. So it's more about the use of a vehicle uh, than it'll keep it for years if, this, if you use your car once a week, it may keep the data for years. If I use my car every day, it may only keep it for months. But general rule of thumb is it's weeks, months, years, depending on the system. Some system. I'm sorry, I was asking uh, how long is it kept after it's extracted by your software? And what, is, and what limitations oh, do you have? That depends on, the, um, depends on the agencies that use it. That's their own internal policies. Because we, we manufacture the software, hardware. We train law enforcement agencies how to use it. It's not something that we actually do ourselves. So what's the size of a hard disk in a car? Uh, 200 gigs is okay. on average. OK. Right. Other questions right here, please? There was a comment earlier today about uh, too many point solutions. As people that have brought stuff to market, what are your thoughts on doing one or two things well versus the challenges of integrating and connecting with a larger suite of things? I'll take that. Uh, Co CodeDX actually does integrate a lot of different point solution products, and that is our value proposition. Uh, and, and there's a business in it. Uh, our customers are finding it very difficult to work with individual point solution products, and they need something, as Nadia said earlier, that will establish the workflow for them and automatically integrate it. So our entire business proposition is pretty much based on taking those point solutions and adding order to it and giving added value above and beyond it. And, and if I may add to that, uh, in terms of the... Uh, the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, that is one of the things that we are very aware of and that we know that when those students graduate that they need to be aware of. If you take a look at all the aspects of the competition, it's not designed to teach them specific point products, but to take a look at cybersecurity in the workforce, what is going to be expected of them. And that's a big task, and that's a lot of things that they have to be prepared for from the soft side to the very technical side. And, uh, you know, one thing that I'd like to add is um, in the verticals that we operate in, uh, having one point solution introduced into that vertical might almost represent an infinite increase in the number of solutions for security in that vertical. So, uh, you know, embedded devices, uh, the market for embedded security technology is, you know, way behind in terms of compared to the general purpose, you know, computer security uh, verticals. But, but you, in the introduction of embedded device security into those verticals 
means you have to integrate with existing technologies and or they have Absolutely. to integrate with you. And a lot of times those yeah. are build the infrastructure that's not even there in order to connect something like the OT network security to the IT network. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Good. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, stop at this point.